morning, I'm Daryl Jones, Director of Research at Hedgeye. Welcome to the Macro Show for June 5th, uh, 2023. Keith is uh, over in Ireland doing a little, little bit of golf and also checking in on a few of our investments. We're excited to have David, David Salem join us this morning on the Macro Show. He recently joined us as a head of a product we're calling Capital Allocation. Prior to joining Hedgeye, David had a, has had a long history uh, advising uh, foundations, working with institutional money managers. Uh, I think started the investment fund for foundations and was yeah. there for 17, 18 years. Mm -hmm. uh, joined us uh, probably three or four months ago, and I think we're looking forward to launching probably early July, something like that. Mm -hmm. But without further ado, I'll hand it off to you and we'll get into the slides. Good morning. Thank you, Daryl, very much. Hope you had a good weekend. And I did. All of our viewers, too. This is going to be a runner-sensitive version of the show, by which I mean I can't tell you how many macro shows I have listened to mm. but not watched because I was running while I was consuming them. So I'm going to try to describe everything that gets um, flashed up on the screen. We're going to start, of course, with the top three things from our macro team today. So, Dan, if you could go to number one, which happens to be on Japan, which will actually be the focal point of this macro show. So I'll be very brief here. Um, and uh, mentioning that on uh, top thing number one, Japan, uh, all signs, as we'll see a little bit later, are indicating that this is a very opportune time to be adding to exposure in Japan. I'm just going to leave it at that, Dan, if you can go to top thing number two on debt. Um, and when he put these together this morning, Christian, I think, used, as he always does, his words carefully and eloquently, um, highlighting at the very end of this discussion of what's going on with uh, uh, resolution of the debt ceiling problem and with pending changes in the size and character of the Treasury General account that we're uh, in an environment, as Christian has described, as very asymmetric conditions. And I'll just leave it at that, and you can read the, uh, the description of it um, at your leisure in the slide deck. Top thing number three is what Christian called K on virgins, and by that he means, um, for better or worse, and this does tie into some data that we probably won't look at this morning, but that we're going to be covering in some detail when the new service capital allocation launches. You just see, uh, when you look at distribution of income and net worth across different societies, um, particularly democratic capitalist regimes like our own and Japan, you see, in many cases, a K phenomenon. By that, we mean that on the upper part of the K, the rich seem to be getting richer. And on the lower part of the K, a lot of people are struggling. I'm going to leave it at that. And if we could go, Dan, right to slide 13, I'm going to dive into what I've called for today. As you can see, if you're watching the slides flash before you, if you're just listening, um, we're going to talk about case studies and capital allocation. And we're going to do it through the prism of something that we're going to be relying on very heavily in the new service, which is something familiar to many of you called in OODA loop, devised initially by um, a genius U U.S. military man, John Boyd, started pulling his thoughts together to create OODA loops first in the mid-'70s, and then he refined them into the 80s. He, he lived until, the, um, until 1997 is when he passed away. But I have become a very big fan of, of OODA loops over the years, and we're going to refer to them repeatedly over the next 15 or 20 minutes as we get through the show. So next slide, number 14, Dan. Um, you can see we're going to do three case studies. The first one I put in because, frankly, I just wanted to be able to do what Keith often does and, and, and share with you a, a book recommendation. The second one will be about, uh, will be very brief, just talking about the current setup for U.S. technology stocks. I know it's on many of your minds, as it is all of ours here at Hedgeye. And then the third and the most extensive dive, maybe five to seven minutes in total, will be on Japan. If uh, you happen to follow me on Twitter or even some of my colleagues, you know that I've been spending an enormous amount of time on issues related to Japan of late, even predating Keith's flipping of the switch from neutral to positive, let's start accumulating, which he did, as many of you know, in late April. But over to the next slide, uh, if you could. Thank you. Um, so he, Keith often holds up a book. I'll hold up a book, one of my favorites, called The Best and the Brightest by David Halberstam. Tragically, we lost him in a car accident some years ago. But I've always been enamored of this book, and I tried to put here, amateur historian that I am, I just tried to lay out an OODA loop and apply it to the tale that David told in the best and the brightest. Basically, as I've said at the top of the slide, 
Um, I call it a case study in capital misallocation. And by that I mean, as we always do, and this will be an important component of the new service that we're launching, we're talking about the deployment of human capital as well as financial capital. And of course, the misallocation of capital that Halberstam describes um, in, in the book um, d did involve a lot of wasted human capital and, of course, a lot of physical and financial capital. I won't go through, again, some of you may be listening and not watching, but the, the OODA loops, as many of you know, uh, we observe, then we orient, then we decide, then we act, O-O-D-A. It has come to mean different things for different people as the OODA concept and framework has been applied very widely, not only to military matters, but to certainly investing, to capital deployment on, on behalf of an operating business. There's really almost no limit. And we may, at the end, if time permits, we may even come back and talk about how it gets applied from time to time in an athletic context. Uh, but I do think the book is really superb. And I'll just say, and as you may know, Daryl, um, a good friend of Hedge Eyes, one of the great privileges for me since I joined the team earlier this year was getting to meet um, extraordinary members of the, of the Hedge Eye community that are public spirited, incredibly thoughtful, and really value additive to everything they do. I happened to be having lunch with one such person a couple weeks ago, and I just mentioned proactively this book and how I was applying it in my own work here. And the, my uh, luncheon companion looked across the table at me very somberly and said, um, David Halberstam was my father-in-law. Oh, and that, wow. was, that was Ryan Harvey. Oh, wow. Who's an extraordinary guy, happens to live not far from here. So yeah. shout out to Ryan if you're watching. Um, I've actually played tennis with Ryan. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Just He's a very good guy. Just yeah. a really, what a great mind. So, yeah. okay, Dan, next page. Um, just briefly here on what's going on in US tech stocks. Again, if you're not watching but only listening, what I tried to do here is set up an OODA loop that emphasizes how important it is as we observe what's going on in the evolving market and investment environment, we do need to take due note, and I think it's very important, of the fact that the A-B process that we use here, looking first at quads, the economics, the fundamentals, to some extent policy, which we will do when we turn to Japan in a few minutes, and then the B process, all the signal work, the excellent signal work that Keith designed, trade, trend, tail, and the like. It is time-tested. So we need to keep that in mind. I won't go through all the other elements of the OODA loop that I've put into the slide deck at slide 16 as it applies to our current thinking about US technology stocks. But I did want to draw your attention to two aspects of the current challenge. As we go to slide 17, it's just a little bit of a sidebar. And again, uh, I'll say this is my opinion, which I'm careful to label as such. But I would encourage any and all of you particularly those of you who are concerned about what's going on in the market, does Hedge Eye, through its A and B process, have a really uh, ready and appropriate grasp of what's going on in the economy and markets? Whatever other contending source of facts and opinions you're receiving, I would just encourage you to filter them through the framework that I've put on uh, slide 17. If you're not, again, uh, watching but just listening, it's a framework we've shown on the screen here before from this studio of my preferred selection criteria for basically any source of facts and opinions on investing or markets that I'm trying to digest and evaluate. Uh, next slide, number 18. Uh, this is a slide many of you have seen before. It's been in the macro themes deck. It was in the mid-quarter update. And it just highlights the fact that you do tend to see pretty reliably the more pronounced the bear market is, the more reliable is the tendency to get counter-trend rallies. And there's a lot of data here from the NASDAQ from uh, its peak in 2000 to its uh, nadir in 2002, where you had a, 11 rallies of more than 10% and four that were uh, between 28 and 49% over that extended, essentially, three-year bear market. Next slide, something that I pulled in from a, a long Twitter thread I did a couple weeks ago that I was gratified, got a lot of attention and comment. Um, again, if you're not seeing the slide, it just highlights the 10 best and the 10 worst days in the S&P's history since its inception in 1926. And often you hear the argument, well, you can't time the market. And if you just miss, say, the 10 best days, you lose out a lot. And that's factually correct. Um, since its inception in 1926, the S&P has compounded roughly 225 
times, a long time. That um, if you remove the 10 best days out of those roughly 24,000, the cumulative return falls from roughly 225x to 75x. Now, what if you reinsert those 10 best days but remove the 10 worst? <laughs> the, the cumulative return soars by more than th threefold to 741x. The, cutting right to the chase, though, what if you exclude both the best and the worst days, mindful that, as the slide indicates, and I found this quite arresting when I first came across this verifiable fact, all of the 10 best days unfolded during bear markets, as <laughs> did all of the 10 worst days. You would expect the latter, right? Yeah, yeah. But not necessarily the former. So yeah. you can study that slide at your leisure, but I'll ask you to, Dan, um, go to page 20, and you see that I took my uh, sort of green marker and highlighted, as I look at the current setup and I go through my OODA loop, which is basically a continuous loop. I mean, Boyd designed it initially based on his experience as a jet fighter pilot in uh, Korea. And then a couple decades later, he organized it in, in the format we now see it, OODA. Um, and it's a continuous process. It's not just a one-time thing. Certainly, if you're in a dogfight, it is. But if you're in a dogfight with markets, you're trying to scratch out alpha or excess return, it's a continuous loop. So you need to constantly ask yourself the question, what am I going to decide? What am I going to decide? And how do I act? My bottom line right now, based on all of the observation that I've done of late, and frankly, going back to the start of my career, suggests that it's appropriate today to stay the course with our core positions. And that brings us to Japan. Um, so over to slide 21. Um, I'm going to talk about this in a little bit more detail than I did the earlier OODA loops. But what we're looking at is a slide that goes through in a rather detailed way, or tries to codify in writing on one page, the OODA loop that I've been going through with respect to Japan, I can say for the last several months, as we look to the launch of capital allocation uh, this summer, but it's really over the entirety of my career. Um, J Japanese stocks have undergone the, the mother of all bear markets, as I say in the first part of the OODA loop, which is observing. I observe that Japanese companies in Japan itself are, I think, materially misunderstood. The rest of it is, is pretty conventional, which is to say when we orient, we set our risk parameters and our return goals. If you're a hedge-eye votary, as I am and have been for a long time, we use our A test. To, to look at what's going on in the economy and policy. Then we use the B test. I'm going to walk you through the application of those tests on some later slides. If we decide, based on all that orientation, that we want to build a core position, we would probably start out, as Keith did in late April, with large cap Japanese stocks, and then broaden the exposure to Japan if and as conditions warrant. And if you follow the re-ranking, and you know this, Daryl, he's been adding to the exposure and broadening it to yep. Japanese stocks that go beyond just the large caps. Um, so acting is just really the, the very fine tuning. Precisely when do you buy and sell? Um, we saw in the top thing, number one for today, that the Japanese market, I think by any objective measure, is kind of overbought as we speak. So you yep. might be trimming some. Yep. And within, I know Keith will be doing that. Yep. I personally don't do that. And we have a lot of um, both current clients and, and others that have expressed great interest in joining the Hedge Eye Fold who have said, we just can't, we're not set up to do that, David. Yep. Can you help us with the new service, establish core positions where we look far enough ahead into the future with our UDA analysis, particularly with observing and orienting, so that we have confidence when we put something into the portfolio, we can hold it for a, a reasonably extended period subject to the all-important principle I just flagged, which is the OODA loop's got to be continuous. So if a piece of information that arrives that's really uh, counter to all your prior uh, beliefs and presumptions, then you really need to stop and, and, and give it due consideration. And that's, Daryl, exactly what I'm going to do in the next few minutes, because yeah. I think some of the, the data we're going to present, this is not opinion, it's just going to be purely data. It's all data-driven. I think some members of our audience are going to find it pretty arresting. Uh, on slide 22, if we could just look at that. Thank you, Dan. Um, what I've done here is just tried to, and I borrowed from my good friend Jesper Cole, who gave me permission to use these slides. Quick sidebar, as you know, Daryl, I was in Nashville most of last week yep. and got a chance to conduct sort of three extended discussions with experts like Jesper, my good friend Andrew McDermott from Mission Value, and others 
on Japan, on the involving setup, basically doing an hour or two OODA loops on each of three days. Delighted, by the way, to have the company of uh, Emily Evans down there. That's her home base, and she's just a terrific lady and just a consummate professional. So shout out to Emily for her gracious hospitality while there. But what we try to do is just pull in all the data and have a close look at them. Many of you know, I mean, the Japanese stock market, by sort of consensus opinion, has sort of been moribund until quite recently when it sort of regained the highs that it achieved in the late 1980s. The PE is substantially compressed, as you can see on the slide. It went from 61 at the end of 89 to 12 at the end of 2022. Um, I'm going to skip over the ROE data you're looking here now. These are for all Japanese stocks, essentially, where the ROE has gone from 1.9% to 8.1% for Japanese companies as a group. Very importantly, the cross holdings, which were a dominant fact of investing life um, when, sort of when I got into the OODA loop on Japan in the late 1980s, have gone from 50%, very roughly, down to 5%. What does cross holdings mean in this context? Yeah, so it means a Japanese company owns shares in another Japanese oh, okay. company. Yeah, that's what I thought. And you can easily imagine, Daryl, how that creates a self yeah, yeah, right. fulfilling, reflexive loop on the way up yep. and on the way down. Yep. Okay. All right, so the next slide, 23, Seltz, thank you. I, I got to ask, and you're going to be doing the, the, the rest of the shows, certainly Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday of this week, I know, and you're going to do it with Andrew and Brian and Josh. What you're looking at is a slide that shows that Japanese companies as a group, their sales have gone flat, right? This confirms the thesis that we've had several lost decades, right? Yeah. But look at the profits. And so I mentioned Andrew and Brian and Josh, because I'll encourage you in, you know, yeah. in the next three days, ask each of them how realistic and feasible might it have been, would it be moving forward for the companies they follow as a group to drive profits up 11x <laughs> over an interval where sales are flat? Yeah, I would say yeah. pretty unlikely, but I could be wrong on that. Yeah. <laughs> so, but that, in fact, is what's happened yeah. on Japanese stocks using 1995 as a base. So this is hardly a lost decade. It is clearly a lost decade or two, or more than that, of course, um, if you look at shareholder returns, and we're going to come back to that in a minute. But that, I think, spells opportunity and not, yeah. and not peril. By the way, the corresponding numbers for the U.S. companies as a group, sales are up 3x over the same interval that Japan's are flat, U.S. profits are up 6x, and as we said, over the same interval, Japanese profits up 11x. How have they, um, how have they handled corporate Japan? What have they done with the profits we just alluded to. We can see that on page 24. In the interest of time, I won't go over it, but you're seeing increasingly that managements are doing things that outside observers, myself included, would say are in the best long-term interest of the shareholders. They have a judicious approach to retained earnings. They're starting to pay out more and more dividends, and they're engaging in buybacks. But the buybacks, by my lights, tend to be price sensitive. We've seen, I think, way too many buybacks in the United States. GE is the poster child for this, uh, a tragic tale uh, where the buybacks were basically consummated in a price insensitive manner, destroying shareholder wealth, and I think really harming society too, but that's for another day. Slide 25, Seltz, thanks. Uh, a different kind of look. You can see earnings on, on Japanese companies since the, the, the zenith of Japanese stock prices in late 1989 have gone up roughly threefold, and yet the PE is compressed very, very dramatically. Um, some have referred to this as kind of the widowmaker trade, although that yeah. tends to be applied more to JGBs. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Diving into the data and keeping a careful eye on the clock, DJ. Um, pay, slide 26, um, just details. And again, we're going to go into this in some detail in capital allocation in the initial editions of our signature element, what we're calling CIO Corner. The data are a little bit hard to read on screen, but I wanted to get them to you. It documents the investment by Japanese companies in their manufacturing facilities in the U.S., far outflanking other countries. Foreign direct investment in the U.S. is at record highs. Also, Japan happens to have the highest level of FDI into the U.S. of any nation in the world. Japanese R&D spending on a very healthy trend. If you look at rate of change, as we always exclusively do here at Hedgeye. It's very impressive. Slide 27, Seltz. It's just a breakout of what you saw in the upper left-hand panel of the prior slide. So these are FDI rankings. Again, if you're not watching but only listening, Japan is number one 
it, by just about every metric. Uh, creating manufacturing jobs, particularly here in the United States. They're number one in total foreign direct investment here in the U.S. in the creation of manufacturing jobs, in total R&D spending, and in the value of merchandise exports from the U.S. under the auspices of Japanese companies to other nations. So you hear sometimes people discuss China's determination to moving from made in China to made by China. But all they're doing there, and I wish them well with that, but all they're doing essentially is what the Japanese have been doing for decades now. To the great advantage and benefit, frankly, of regions like the one that I spent most of last weekend, uh, it was no surprise that we were talking about Japan in Nashville, because many of you know, I think, in the audience, um, how significant a presence uh, Japanese companies have in that part of our country. They've created, uh, using a workforce that, frankly, a, a number of large U.S. companies had, had abandoned and saying, no, these people are incredibly hardworking, they have a great work ethic, they're smart, and we can train them. And they've done exactly that, particularly in the state of Tennessee. All right, so slide 28 real quick. This is my adaptation of an outline that my good friend Andrew McDermott put together for one of our sessions last week. Um, and it's just a list of bullets looking at, in the upper panel, at the convergence of some very favorable micro trends within Japan. We talk about inter intergenerational management transfers, the unwinding of cross holdings that Daryl asked about uh, earlier, the rising returns on and of capital, which I already documented, value driven capital allocation. And then we can turn, as we always do when we do sort of our A-test, we do you know, the economic quads, uh, which feed into a, a, a careful consideration of growth, inflation, and policy. And I think the policy set up in, in Japan is very, very attractive. Some people look at it and say, well, they've had three prime ministers in the last five years, and they deem it politically unstable. I actually think the fact that there's been enormous continuity in policy, notwithstanding those personnel changes at the top, suggests that this is more of a feature than a bug of Japanese society and economy. Other bullets that we mentioned, the unwavering commitment to liberal democratic principles with the L being a small L, not a large L. Very strong social co cohesion under a lot of stress. I think that's important. Our colleague Neil Howe might have something to say about that when he comes back on the macro show. Mm -hmm. Um, a preference for actual engineering over financial engineering. I was actually going to interject for a second, <clears throat> and you know, obviously demographics in Japan is a big one. You know, the population effectively shrinking, um, which you know in part could be why you know that's always in people's minds, right? So maybe you know to your point on sales, sales isn't really growing. They don't see a lot of demographic growth, <laughs> but you look under the hood, and actually there's a lot of really positive things happening that maybe have been put to the side because people are thinking too much about this demographic headwind. Yeah. But, you know, how, do you, how do you, I guess, think about that or yeah. incorporate it, that? It's a great point. I'll use the, the, you know, the, the, the expression I used just a second ago. Is, I'll put it in the form of a question, Daryl. It's an excellent one. Is, is what you just ticked off a feature or a bug from the viewpoint of investors in Japanese companies? Because, again, we can talk all day long about government and policy and politics and all that, but we're here to help our, peop our, our yeah. audience invest more effectively. Yeah, yeah, exactly. right? And from the viewpoint of an investor, the, the discipline that you've seen, the capacity to yeah. drive profits up 11x while sales were flat, yeah. is, a, is in part, and I would argue in large part, a function of those awful demographics, yeah, which yeah. are going That's to continue. Yeah. So, all That's right, a so, great way to look at it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. All right, slide 29 real quick. So this is this, the rigorous application uh, by me, or at least it's an attempt to do that on one page of both our A test and a B test. So we ask, is it a favorable quad setup? Not just now, but we look, as I you know, say almost every time I open my mouth around here, we're looking at conditional probabilities. There are no certainties in life. There are no certainties here in investing. So we're looking out at the next quarter, the one after that, and the one after that. And I think everybody on the call probably, I hope, have access to the macro themes, and they can see the setup for Japan. It's very favorable, so when I apply the A test to Japan, it's check, 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 check. Then we come to our B test, we ask, among other things, and we're going to go into this in much more detail in capital allocation over time, but if we had to reduce the sort of B test, our Keith's proprietary signals, to just four elements, we'd say, all right, is it a bullish trend? The answer, yes. Is it a bullish tail? Yes. Do we have a rising trade duration risk range, meaning uh, the lower end of the range and the high end of that range is going up? 
Uh, over a trade duration, yes. How about over a trend duration? The answer is yes. Yeah. Just open the kimono a little bit, and I got these from Keith before he took off over the weekend. Um, the, the tail level on the Nikkei now is, as we say in the running world, 27 high. It's specifically <laughs> 27893. Trend is 28668. Uh, trade, as you know from your daily pin sheet, 3509 to 31667. I think what's really arresting is what was the last close? 32217. Yeah. So that number is above all the other numbers right. I cited. This yeah. is an incredibly bullish environment. And I said we would wrap up right at 25 past the hour. Okay. And that's let's, where we let's are. Let's get into some questions. Uh, I'm going to try to. Okay, I thought this was interesting. Uh, you know, and maybe you can talk a little bit about historical context and you know maybe how your view has changed over time but this is from Andre uh, good morning David how would you advise an institution on precious metals exposure here how do you view this precious metals space relative to years past and I'll, I'll just add to that I guess how is your thinking on precious metals changed or not changed over time yeah I'll try to be succinct in answering all these that's questions a lot of questions so we, but you know basically so precious to, metals yeah yeah so the starting point for me in answering any question of this sort, Dell, as you know very well, um, is to think about what are the parameters that are governing the investment program in question, right? So his investment program might be very different from mine, might be very different from your alma mater, yep. the Yale Endowment, and there's an endless list. So we need to think really rigorously. It's a, it's a key element of what we're going to be doing with capital allocation. What are our risk parameters? What are the types and degrees of risk that we're willing to incur in pursuit of whatever return? And then we form return objectives in light of those risk parameters, never the other way around. So assuming we've done that, and we've done it in a kind of logical and coherent way, and I've distributed to the Hedge Eye community now a couple times my sort of preferred approach for my own portfolio and some endowed charities that I've advised, that typically and historically, to get one out to one element of your good question, or Andre's, uh, has not favored gold because um, there were other more attractive assets to achieve the goal that you might have been pursuing with gold. Now, people look at it differently. I've always looked at gold as a kind of dual purpose hedge. It can be a hedge against hyperinflation at one extreme, and it can be a hedge, and it historically has been against extended deflations on the other. With most of the middle <laughs> not being an attractive environment for gold relative to everything else. So final point in answering the question. Where have we been for essentially, Daryl, the entirety of my career, X, frankly, the epoch since the end of 2021? Yeah. And it's, you've been in that very attractive middle where you haven't needed a hyperinflation, and, uh, 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 sorry, a, a, a hedge against hyperinflation, and you haven't needed one against an extended deflation as distinct from disinflation. Yeah. Now I think the tide has turned, and I can only say I don't want to sound like a sycophant because I think I'm anything but that uh, temperamentally. But I, I think what Keith has done with precious metals, generally speaking, since the tide turn, has been very adept. Okay. Um, so we have, I think, you know, maybe a couple counters to the thesis or discussion on Japan. I'm going to sort of ask them both together. Um, this is David. As they have increased manufacturing abroad, do you have any idea of how much the profit increase for Japanese companies is re related to the depreciation of the yen? Uh, and the second one is, is pointing out how good Japanese profits have been a good metric for future performance? <clears throat> you know, so we're, you know, we're sort of, you know, combining the depreciation of the yen and, you know, the, the idea that, you know, historically the, the increase in profits really haven't driven performance, but, you know, now we're sort of citing that as a, a potential catalyst. Yeah, on the yen, I don't have an exact answer. I'll, I'll get yeah, one, yeah. right? Uh, I, I think it's a material aspect of, this, of, the, of the setup, the observations, to go back to our, our, our preferred OODA loop, that we've been uh, ticking off or flagging here. But I don't think its removal would reverse the sign and indicate that you either want to be neutral in Japan at this point, given all of the relevant factors, yeah. or short Japan. Um, I'm not sure I actually understand the second part of that question, though. I want to be responsive to it. But, well, I think that, you know, the yeah. point is, you know, we're talk we were talking about how um, Profits have grown so much in the past, but you know the stock market performance wasn't really great. Now we're yeah. sort of looking at that historically. Yeah. But I, th you know, I think the point is, is is maybe different, which is we have the perfect OODA loop in a sense for for Japan, and then whether you call it a narrative or thesis, 
is actually quite compelling as well, yeah. like the fundamental uh, thesis. So <laughs> I think that's actually when you do get really great opportunities in the market, when you know the signals are saying yes, the quads are saying yes, and then we look at the fundamentals and they're saying yes as well. Yeah, or putting it a little bit differently, I think that's very well put. And I'll just try to add to it. Again, in the conversations I've had with a lot of our current clients and those who I think are keen on joining the hedge I fold, they've said essentially, and I think there's some merit to this, I need for everything, I need for the entire formation, all of my observation, all of my orientation to be favorable before I'm going to take my client's precious capital if you're an RIA. Yep. And then sit down at one of you know, my quarterly lunches with one of my clients and say, this is exactly why we put your money into Japan. Yep. We hope it can stay there forever. I'm sorry, not forever, but for a prolonged <laughs> period. Yep. Um, we're prepared to remove it if the fundamental, if our ongoing OODA loops cause us to say, no, we were, that was not a good place to put it. But we really want to keep that bar very high. And that's what we're going to try to do in the new service. Okay. As yeah. we wrap up here, I'm going to ask you one last question. Um, we talked about it a little beforehand, but you're wife recently, I think, visited Japan, and you had like an interesting story that relates to this whole discussion we've had. Oh, it actually yeah. wasn't recent. Oh, that, yeah, that's oh. a fun story. I'll, I'll do the one-minute version, then we can wrap okay. up. Um, yeah, it's actually, when you think about it, it's, it's an interesting application of OODA loop. So Amory was over there in 1997 with Team USA. Oh, so that wasn't yeah. <laughs> recently. Okay. Yeah, yeah. She was playing lacrosse in, yeah. in the World Championship, the World Cup, uh, and they went into double overtime against Australia in the final. Okay. Right, so and I've seen the film of it. It's kind of neat, and you can see that she's there's a loose ball. Yeah, but she's the youngest member of the team, and if you're the youngest member of a lacrosse team, you don't take the shot in the double <laughs> overtime. Right, you pass it to somebody older and more experienced. Yeah, but you can see the OODA loop goes off, and she just says, "What the hell? You know, this game has gone on long enough." She fires into the goal, walk off goal. They win the world championship. The, actually, actually, the last shot she ever took in in competition as a lacrosse player. Um, but I think it was really interesting, if I can go on for 10 more seconds, yep. Daryl, because I can stand here and I can look to our main conference room, and we've got nine interns, and I'm, they're not watching the show now, but I'm sure they'll go back and watch each of the shows that we produce while they're here as our interns. But they're clearly the youngest member of the team. They're welcome members of the team. Yep. Amory did what she did as the youngest member of that team. And, and age isn't important, right? It's your passion for what you do. It's your work ethic. It's your intellect. It's your curiosity. And I'm just delighted we've got nine people. And I want to thank you publicly for all the support you've given me to start to you know, dive into capital allocation yep. and for saying you can have an intern for the summer. I'm going to share <laughs> it with Josh, but yeah. I'm really delighted. So thank you, Daryl, and Absolutely. thank our audience for yep. their Th time this morning. Yeah, thanks, everybody, for tuning in. And uh, tomorrow we have uh, Josh Steiner, so we're going to dig deep into both macro, housing, and financials to so get your questions ready. Uh, have a great day out there, everybody, and we're back at it tomorrow at 9 a.m. Take care.